So before we start editing, we're gonna go on a little bit of road trip because see, I have an issue with stacking my books, which means that, you know, they're very hard to rescue sometimes. So I rescued all of the books that I can. And then I'm gonna show you some books that we'll, we'll talk about. They're, they're pre-read books, so it doesn't matter. But first of all, look right here at this little thing called A Gathering of Shadows. We'll talk about this one later. And then right up here, we have Of Mice and Men. This is also a book we will talk about later. So this is our fun little field trip that I hope you liked. Let me place you at a convenient angle. That's joy of uh, lights. So this is my book haul. I've had a book haul in so long and I, I love book hauls. I like talking about consumerism. I, I like talking about materialism. I like talking about the ails of the world. And I, I have an ungodly amount of books. Like I'll, I'll admit that, but most of these were cheap or free and I, I can't resist. And my thoughts about libraries and books is always that I really enjoy having books at my disposal. I have books a fair bit of books that are out into the world that people have borrowed and I want to do that. I did not grow up with a lot of books and I had a lot of regrets about that. Like wanting to read and not having access to books sucks. So I never want to have that and I want other people to have that too. So I buy a bunch of $2 books and this is my journey. So the book that I actually read for $1, which is amazing because I loved it and it was a five star or four star and it is, I think, well, let's look. Uh, it is. $37 Canadian. I got it for $1. It was $2 and it was on a half off sale at a thrift store. I, I love this so much. This is an interesting book. A lot of people didn't like it. I knew nothing into it and I kind of don't want to tell you anything about it because the way that it's presented often spoils it, I think. And like maybe other things spoil it as well, but pretty much the story of this is there's a man and a woman and they meet in the 1920s era and they fall in love and both of them are people that struggle with social communication. Like both of them have been kind of outlawed by society by being kind of quiet, more eccentric and liking that. And it talks about like them meeting in this sitting room and, and seeing that and like seeing someone who could be quiet, who didn't mind not being the loudest person in a social community and those things. And I really like it. And it has many twists and turns. And I think most people have spoiled the other sections, but I kept on being like, oh my goodness. Like I knew it had different parts, but I didn't know what the different parts were. And I was figuring it out as it came. And it was such a delightful, like if you can read this as a surprise book, I think you should, because I think some of the reveals like, you know, it's in marketing, but that doesn't mean that like it shouldn't be a surprise. Anyways, that, that is my thing for trust. I think it's great. And the second book I got, I will talk about up there. It is Of Mice and Men. This is a 1930s book about these two men that go on a journey because everything is poor and everything is unemployed and they keep on, you know, going, doing their work and then being unemployed because it's the 1930s and Dust Bowl. And they come upon a farm and have interesting relationships. And I'm not sure if I agree with the morals. Like I know the ending and part of it is probably paternalistic and ableist and I don't know how I feel about it reading it now but it is one of those books that like makes you think and makes you sad in like 60 pages. Sometimes I love the references I have so this is called Put Out More Flags and I bought it in part because I have the one of Brideshead Revisited which is the same version I was like yes and it's two dollars and uh also Put Out More Flags what a great title so I actually looked at it once at a thrift store looked up the description at home and the star rating of reviews before buying it and then I came back and bought it for one dollar. <laughs> like a week later. Anyways, so so the things that I have is Scoundrel Basil, terrible, goes off to war. And that, that's pretty much the, the, the de definition of the book that I found. It's like, he has three women who hate him. His mother, his sister, and his mistress. And I was like, okay. And when Winston Churchill declares war, he goes off to fight on the thing. And it's like, okay, I don't really know. I feel like he writes like entitled people of the 20th century is kind of the vibe I've always gotten. So I don't know. I, I like like, I like comedy of manners or like books that are just about society and thinking and stuff. So hopefully I'll like it. I haven't read any Wog yet, but I'm investing him $1 at a time. And then if we're going more into like the depravity of man and hatefulness, we have Lord of the Flies. <laughs> this is a book that I actually studied a lot. I, I wrote a lot of essays about it in school about depravity of man and the ways of evil and all of those things. And I enjoyed this book as an intellectual property as a comparison and looks at things. I actually enjoyed reading it, but it's not a book that I agree with morally, I guess. Like, I, I know, I, I like to look at the good in people. I like to look at the bright side. I like to believe that like, you know, the reason people do things isn't because of civilization because I think that's all are really paternalistic and colonialism and all of those things that like if we don't have English society we will become savages and that word itself is incredibly problematic so it's a book that I don't know if I'll ever reread but it's a book that if I talk about it like, I got this book for very cheap and now I can talk about it 
with a pretty version and this pig head terrified me as a child like my goodness when you have to like write essays and look at this every day in your book you're like why is this pig head also some great moments of horror like i'd be interested to read in it because i know and remember it being quite well written and like even like sam and roger is it and, and even sam and eric and how they combine into one thing because these characters at the beginning and they're twins and their names are sam and eric and by the end sam and eric goes from like that i think to like the enzyme to then being one word and the ways in which that conveys i feel like it's something that i might actually enjoy now so maybe it's a book i do need to reread even though it's not like a book that i'm ever going to read and be like ah yes and i know a lot of it is about because it was written shortly after world war ii so it's about how like the depravity of what men did on the battlefield and stuff as well so it might also be interesting because put out more flags is more about like the glory of war and almost like the hero and stuff like that or maybe he's looking for the hero or maybe he should be a hero but he's only a scoundrel so maybe those would be books to read in conjunction and the next book is a book i'm not sure i'm gonna keep it's called pax by sarah pennypacker and a lot of people in my church keep on asking me for kids books and especially kids books for like five to seven year olds and i'm always like i wish i knew something so this is a middle grade book that hits me as something i could read to a younger child so my goal in the next few months is to read this book and see if I can pass it to a six-year-old's mom and be like hey read this because some middle grade books are great and some I would definitely not read to a six-year-old and the next two books are by an author I really really love so Kirsten White I read originally because she shares the first name with me and this is the last book in the and we darken series and I got it for six dollars at chapters I was so hard not only was it six dollars I got it six dollars on a gift card and that was really lovely this is a series where it gender swaps Vlad the Impaler so it asks if Vlad was a woman named Lada as a young girl and it, it follows her story from being the son of a prince in Romania and then them being exiled to the Ottoman Empire and growing up there kind of as captives like not really as captives but as collateral like don't invade us or step out of line otherwise we will kill your children and their and their relationship with the prince who is a younger prince who has older brothers but like it's more of a country where like whoever is the last to survive is the person that will secede. It's not inherited by order of age. So it's a really interesting book and it's actually straight historical fiction. Like it often gets seen as fantasy. I can see based on the title and stuff, but it doesn't have anything magical in it. And another book by her that I haven't read and one of her earliest reads is The Chaos of Stars. And yeah, Kirsten White is an author I really, really love. And sometimes I've had a little bit mixed results with her, but I, I do really want to read this book eventually. And when I saw it for like $2, I was like, yes. So this is about how it's hard to be a teenager, especially when you're the daughter of an Egyptian gods and I'm like sure sure it's like when I have a good feeling I'll just read it and then I'll talk about the gathering of shadows this is the second book in the Schwab series A Darker Shade of Magic which I've read the first two I've never finished the third and I like it well enough I feel like I have been harsher on her in the past because I don't think that she's like the best executor of ideas I think she has great ideas I just don't think that like they always fulfill level of beauty or accomplishment that the original idea says and I feel like I just have to accept that when I read V.A. Schwab like the only book that I've read that like I liked the beginning as much as I liked the ending was Vicious I thought it was really really well done every other of her book I'm like I liked the idea better than the execution but you know that doesn't make someone as a bad writer like I feel like plot and accomplishment like I think ideas and explorations of ideas can be very interesting I also liked her middle grade series like that one was pretty good as well but like all of her books are kind of more middle of the road so it's one of those things where like I'm like okay I'll read them when I read them and I'm always intrigued the vibes are always there but this one I'm like I saw it for two dollars I was like I already have the first book I may as well pick it up and I read the book like four years ago I think I would like to read A Conjuring of Light like as I think about it I think I would be happy the next book I'm going to talk about is Split Tooth by Tanya Talek and this is a very interesting book. I read it several years ago and I liked it. I found that like it's one of those books that brings up a lot of trauma which makes it very difficult to enjoy fully. It's I think it's partly memoir, part of like it's a very like heavy autofiction and I'll, I'll just read like the first few pages. It also has really nice page lineup. Like I really like that. It's very nice. So it says 1975. Sometimes we would hide in the closet when the drunks came home from the bar. Knee to knee we would sit hiding hoping nobody would discover us. Every time it was different. Sometimes there was only thumping, screaming, moans, laughter. Sometimes the old woman would come in and smother us with her suffering love, her love so strong and heavy it seemed a burden. Even then I knew love could be a curse. Her love for us made her cry. The past became a river that was released by our eyes. The poison of alcohol and her breath would fill the room. She would wail and grab at us, kissing, kissing, the only thing she could trust. Fake wood panels, the smell of smoke and fish, Velvet art hung from the walls, usually Elvis and Jesus, but also popular bears and Eskimos. 
The drunks came home rowdier than usual one night, so we offed the closet. We giggled nervously as the yelling began. We came silent when the thumping starts. The whole house shakes. Women are screaming, but the sound is overtaken by the sound of things breaking. Wet sounds of flesh breaking and dry sounds of wood snapping. Is that a bone? Silence. There was a loud punding footsteps. Sometimes it's coming toward us. We stop breathing. Our eyes large in the darkness. We huddle and shiver and hope for the best. There is something standing right outside the door, panting. The door slides open and my uncle sticks his head in, towering over us and saying and slurring, blood pouring down his face, some wound above his head. I just want to tell you kids not to be scared. Then he closes the door. So that's the, that's the first chapter and we have a nice illustration. And I, I actually find the writing more beautiful reading it in person because I read it on audiobook because like reading this is traumatic as you can tell like this is this is a hard scene to read and like it's harder to read like over and over again like it's very very visceral which means if you've had trauma like this it it really brings up a lot of it so um yeah I, I would say that it's a book that I hope to reread because I think the language and the storytelling is beautiful but I feel like the first time I read it I, I couldn't get past the like this is incredibly traumatizing. Like, you know, when your brain just shuts off and all you can think of like is, it doesn't feel like a safe work, so I don't like it, even if it's well-written. So it's, it's a book that I will have on my shelf gladly and hopefully reread at one point, but definitely a book that I struggled with the first time I read it. So the next book that I'm gonna talk about is also by a Canadian author and very different, is Little Brother by Cory Doctorow. And this is a, the science fiction dystopian that kind of looks at internet culture and things like that. I've heard really, really good things about his books. So I'm hoping that I'll really like it. I don't know much and it's probably not the highest on my TBRI, but again, it was inexpensive and I was like, I like Canadian authors and I, I've heard a lot about Dr. O and I don't necessarily know where to start. So this seemed like a book to, to pick up. And maybe those are things like justifications. When I, I feel like this is one of the books that I look back and I'm like, I didn't need to buy this probably. Like I probably could have saved the $3, but sometimes we'll have regrets, but it has an X on the cover. <laughs> So this is a book that I didn't know a lot about. Like it's a book that I thought I know more about because I honestly, I always picture this book as being like in the 18th century, like an Italian village. <laughs> I don't feel like that's what this book is called. I actually broke it right there and I'm so sad, but I really like this cover. I like, I like the white, like the, the, this is less fun, but this writing, I love it. It's called If on a Winter's Night, A Traveler. And it's by Italo Calvino, I think is how you say his name. And I, I tried to write down this description of this book. And I was like, I, I am so confused. It's experimental to begin with. And it deals with narration. And it, what did I write? Oh, Togetherness, Married Readers, Solitude, How You Choose to Read. So I feel like it's very metafictional because it's like the real one and stuff like that. Um, oh, let, let's see this one. It's, it says, it turned out to be not one novel, but 10, each with a different plot, style, ambulance, and author, and each interrupted in a moment of suspense. Together they form a labyrinth of literatures, known and unknown, alive and extinct, through which two readers, a male and female, pursue a story, lines, and intrigue, then and one another. Like, one of the other quotes was like, in, in the description on Goodreads was like, only in reading and lovemaking do you lose yourself and become greater than your parts? And I was like, okay. Uh, let, let's let's see. You are about to begin reading Italo Calvino's new novel, If on a Winter Night's One. Is this the beginning of the chapter? Because I, I heard that there's a fake person and a real person. So anyways, okay. Oh yeah. Relax, concentrate, dispel every other thought. Let the world around you fade. Best to close the door. The TV is always on in the next room. Tell the others right away. No, I don't want to watch TV. Raise your voice. They won't hear you otherwise. I'm reading. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to be disturbed. Maybe they haven't heard you. With all that racket, speak louder. Tell, I'm beginning to read Italo Calvino's new novel. Or if you prefer, don't say anything. Just hope they'll leave you alone. Find the most comfortable position, seated, stretched out, curled up, or lying flat. Flat on your back, on your side, on your stomach, in the easy chair, on the sofa, in the rocker, in the deck chair, on the hassock. In the hammock, if you have a hammock, on top of your bed, of course, or in the bed, you can even stand on your hands, head down in the yoga position with the book upside down, naturally. <laughs> okay, I, I feel like I heard that this is partly about reading. Okay, that's very interesting. Also, I have a short story that I didn't realize was copying this about like the ways in which people read. Now I feel like I'm just a hack. Okay, I, I'm just opening it to a random page to see if the vibe is still the same. Uh, in writing, in writing to Calvin, in writing to Cavdenga, I wish I was better at Italian names. In writing to Cavdegi, uh, oh my goodness. In reading to Cavdenga, I'm so dyslexic. Okay, 
Marana always has some practical reason to justify her delay in the delivery of the translation, to press for payment of the advances, to point out the new foreign publications they shouldn't let slip. So this is apparently very much about reading. Okay, let's, let's try another one. A key turns in the lock, you fall silent as if you wanted to surprise her, as if to confirm to yourself and to her that your being here is something natural. That sounds very sinister. But the footstep is not hers. Slowly a man materializes in the hall. You see his shadow through the curtains, a leather windbreaker, a step indicating familiarity with the place but hesitant, but hesitant as if something, as if someone looking for something, you recognize him. It is Ernan, it, in Nero. Er, er, in Nero? Or Nero? It is Ar Nero. I feel like that's how you say it. But um, yeah, interesting. I, I, I definitely think I, I've heard the writing is very beautiful here and I understand why people like it. Without fear of wind or vertigo. Okay, this is actually going up my TBR, but just like, it feels like it will just be pleasant to read. I, I am a sucker for beautiful prose. Like, I feel like a lot of people would start that and be like, oh no, 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 no. But it kind of gives me like princess vibes. It kind of gives me princess bride vibes and like also like several short stories and stuff. And I like it a lot. The next book is another reread that I bought and I am so happy. Do you see this beautiful floppy cover? Like this in my mind is how every book should be written. Look at that beautifulness. You can tell that I'm filming at like 12 30 at night because that's why I'm so tired. But this is a beautiful book by Emily St. John Mandel that, you know, exploded in popularity last year because it deals with pandemics and stuff. But I, I really like it because it's it's about this Shakespearean company and we're looking at their Shakespearean company and then we're jumping 20 years ahead where they are traveling around and dealing with people as they come along and stuff like that. And they deal with being, you know, they're trying to help people in apocalypse by doing Shakespeare and having relationships and friendships and stuff and I really like it. I also I mostly just like the author in the back in the past, the ways in which she's telling stories and the the comic and stuff like that of Station Eleven and the relationships of I'm not sure what his name is. I'm very bad at characters and names and stuff like that but pretty much we Oh, Elegant Theatre. It's also at Elegant Theatre in Toronto, which is like I don't live in Toronto but I feel live very close and I have watched things at Elgin Theatre so this made me so happy. But I, I'm getting distracted by it. But it also like looks at a man and he experiences, you know, it things ending and buying toilet paper and all of those things that, you know, it's very funny that it was written in 2014, I think. So yeah, this is a very good book. I, I like The Glass Castle better as a piece of fiction, but this is also a really fascinating book. And one that I would also love to reread because I read it the first time and really, really enjoyed it. And then this is a book that I thought I wrote the title wrong because I was like, oh no, it must be wrong. And there's just, there's two titles. So it's one is called my grandmother wants to tell you she's sorry and this one says my grandmother sends her regards and apologies which is perfectly fine because it's translated fiction and this is another book i'm going to read the first few pages because i read it in the chapters that i bought it this is my friend gave me a gift card for my birthday and i really loved it because i bought this and i was like i never ever buy new books and this is a book where like i had many ideas about what i was going to read and then i read this and i was like okay i really enjoyed his nonfiction about like his uh, things that I need to tell my son, as well as his fiction of Beartown and Anxious People. And this just seems like his vibe is just so good. And I think this vibe needs to be read to be explained. Every seven-year-old deserves a superhero. That's just how it is. Anyone who doesn't agree needs their head examined. That's what Elsa's granny said, at least. Elsa is seven going on eight. She knows she isn't especially good at being seven. She knows she's different. Her headmaster says she falls into line in order to achieve a better fit with her peers. Other adults describe her as very grown up for her age. Elsa knows that it's just another way of saying massively annoying for her age. Because they only tend to say that when she corrects them for mispronouncing deja vu or not being able to tell the difference between me and I at the end of a sentence. And then like, see, like that's kind of the vibe. And then, and then it jumps down to the granny is 77 years old going on 78. She's not very good at it either. You can tell that she's old because her face looks like a newspaper stuffed in wet shoes, but no one ever accuses granny of being grown up for her age. Perky people sometimes say Elsa's mum looks either fairly worried or fairly angry as mum sighs and asks how much she owes for the damages. I, I don't really know any of the other vibes, but I love that it's like an intergenerational family thing. It's funny. I, I would probably read anything that he would write. If I read it, it will be my six Bachman, but it won't be the first one I own because again, new books can't own them. I hope that you enjoyed my November haul. Let me know which books you read this year. And if you want to comment, comment a stack of books. Always enjoy that. And let me know which one I should prioritize. I hope you enjoyed my dramatic reading of some of the things in here and confusion about what they're about. But uh, happy reading and writing and I will see you next time.